Back on 31 July, I uploaded a video to YouTube, and I asked why we were still a nation. I pointed out that the elements of consensus that once held this country together have basically been undermined or destroyed. And what I suggested was there really was nothing but habit, inertia, holding this country together. Today, somewhat to my surprise, and it's the, I think it's the 28th of December as I record this, I don't know when it'll actually get uploaded, might be a couple of days, but I ran across an article in the Huffington Post asking basically the same question. The Huffington Post's headline was, the Divided Nation Asks, What Holds This Country Together? And it pointed out, uh, correctly, I, I, would, I would say, that while elections are supposed to settle differences in the country, the election of 2020 failed to do that. In fact, it exacerbated the differences in the country. Now, of course, it's written from a perspective of, you know, confused uh, progressives who don't understand what happened and why Trump is doing the things he did, he does, and, you know, why his followers don't believe that this was an honest and open election which is, is kind of a stretch considering how they reacted to the 2016 election. But setting that aside, it's still a valid point because this is what I asked months ago. And it's interesting to see that now the progressive left is starting to ask the same question. What does hold this country together beyond habit and inertia? And I would say the same thing I said on the end of July. Nothing. <laughs> There's really nothing else there. And there's less there today at the end of December than there was when I uploaded the last video at the end of July. Historically, it's by no means unusual to see factionalism in this country, associated with party or not, and to see one faction or the other get really worked up, become, you know, to quote Robert Palmer, who's no relation, hyperactive. And we're seeing that today, you know, on the right, more or less, uh, after the 2020 election. The problem is, we saw it from the left after 2016. And I don't think that their hyperactivity has yet ended. So now you have a situation after 2020, where both of these factions, left and right, progressives, conservatives, however you want to define them, are in this hyperactive state. And as an American historian, I tried to think back, when was, when was the last time this happened? Because it has happened. What you usually see in American history, going back to the founding, is that one side or the other gets into this kind of hyperactive state and they push for you know whatever it is they're pushing for, civil rights, populism, progressivism. Uh, and, and we've seen that time and again. What we usually don't see, though, is where both factions take up you know, positions against each other and are simultaneously in a hyperactive state. The only time I can think of that happening in American history, since the U.S. Constitution at least, is right before the Civil War basically the 1850s. The issue of slavery had always been a problem, going back to the founding. It had divided the country. It caused problems. That's why we kept having compromises, because they were trying to find political solutions to the problem. Things started getting out of hand with the Mexican War. At least that's how I teach U.S. history. The Mexican War was a real problem, because you were bringing in a slave state. And you see people in the North Abraham Lincoln being one of them, who were opposed to the war because, not because they didn't want to take more territory and didn't want to see the U.S. grow, it was because they knew if Texas came in, it would be the extension of slavery further south and further west, and it would be more slave states, and that's what they didn't like. And after that, you have a series of events in the United States that create an even more hyperactive situation. You have the uh, compromises of, of 1850, you know, which includes the Fugitive Slave Act, which means the, the drama of slavery and people being drug off into slavery is played out, not just in the South where nobody sees it, 
but in northern cities at a time when you have a telegraph and the press. So if something happens in Philadelphia, it can be reported throughout all the other cities, you know, within a day. That was bad news. It was bad publicity for the South. However, as much as a victory they thought it was to be able to, you know, grab their slaves back, it was a PR disaster. And then you have uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which sort of undermines some of the other compromises, which leads to the birth of the, the new Republican Party. The Republican Party had basically popped out of nowhere and expanded quickly. They had, by 1860, taken the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Now, not all Republicans were abolitionists. If you were an abolitionist, you were probably a Republican. But there were most of the Republicans just wanted to contain slavery. You could be a, an outright racist and be a Republican because you wanted to preserve the West and, and the North for the white man. You didn't want blacks there. You didn't want slaves there because you didn't want to have to compete if you were a lower class white with slave labor. I mean, who would? So you have this coalition of people and they're getting more and more inflamed from, you know, after 1854 and the Republican Party basically is a response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And then you have Bleeding Kansas, the Dred Scott decision, John Brown's raid. All these things are happening right up to the election of 1860. And Southerners are watching this with concern. Now, the election of 1860 doesn't solve anything. It actually causes the South to get inflamed because it didn't settle things. They were hoping that it would, but in part because of the way the uh, Electoral College works, Abraham Lincoln, who got about 40% of the vote, won the presidency, whereas the Democrat candidates running under different factions of their party Northern and Southern and nationalist and secessionist split the vote, didn't win much of anything out of the South, and ended up losing, even though the popular vote, they got 60% of the vote. So what you have after the election of 1860, November 1860, are you have both sides, the, the you know, anti-slavery, containment of slavery coalition, the Republicans, and the pro-slavery or, you know, leaving slavery up to the local states, Democrats, and they don't solve their issues. In fact, what you end up with is an inflammation. You have this hyperactivity on both sides, like we have today. We just had an election that didn't solve anything. The left is still hyperactive, and now the right is joining them in hyperactivity. And like I said, the last time we've seen this in American history, I would argue, was right before the American Civil War. And of course, I've been arguing and warning for years now about the dangers of a coming civil war. The basics of a situation we're in now are, are, are really simple. If you look at the concepts of Americanism, of American government, Republican government, free market capitalism, if you look at those concepts, the progressive left does not embrace them anymore. They just want to destroy them. They want to destroy elements of the Constitution. They want to do away the Senate. They would like to do away the Electoral College. They want to stack the Supreme Court. They want to bring in more states so that they'll get control, bigger control of the Senate. We can see what they want. That was counterbalanced before by say, the conservative faction, Republicans, if you want to call them that, Trumpists, whatever you want to call them, people who still believed in those concepts and the institutions which embodied those concepts in the American government. The problem with the election, post-election period now, is that you have a left, progressive left, which doesn't buy these things anymore and hasn't bought them in better more than a decade. But now you have, I would argue, the conservative faction, the right-wing faction, no longer believing that the institutions we have are preserving those concepts. Basically, they still believe in Republican government. They still believe in free market capitalism. 
What they no longer believe is that the institutions, as they're presently constructed and operating, are protecting those concepts. And I think that's what's become so dangerous now. Because basically, if you look at both sides, one side doesn't believe in the system, and the other side no longer has faith in the system. So now the question is, not only are we left and right differed, different, as I argued back on July 31st, it's even worse than that now. Because now, while the sides differ, they're united in a way, in the sense that they think the system doesn't work. The left thinks it doesn't work because it can't work, because it's not the system they want. And the right no longer believes it works because it's, it's not working. It's not protecting the things that they want it to protect. It seems to have sold them out or been sold out. And you see a lot of this, especially if you are a Republican, if you are a conservative, you know, looking at conservative voices, you can see them, a sense of desperation among many of them, feeling left down by, by the Republican Party, feeling left down by the Senate, feeling left down by the House, feeling left down, not so much by Trump, but by Bill Barr, by the Justice Department, by the FBI, by the CIA, being left down by the states, you know, Republicans in Georgia, Republicans in Pennsylvania who passed, you know, Act 17, which screwed up the election for mail-in voting. I mean, so they can't just blame that on the Democrats. They passed the damn thing. And I think you see now people on the right are just throwing up their hands. It's not that they don't like American concepts. They just don't think that they're being fulfilled by any of these institutions, including the United States Supreme Court, which wouldn't even hear of a Texas case. I mean, I, would, I really think they should have heard it, even if they ruled for Pennsylvania and Georgia and the other states, it would have been better than what they did as far as, as the, the right is concerned. So I think that's where we're at today. And when I, when I read this story in the Huffington Post, I said, well, this is really bad. Because, you know, before I used to feel like, well, it's just me. You know, I was a lone voice. and Maybe, uh, maybe I just, you know, an alarmist. But, you know, as, as we've gone along, it seems like it's not that uncommon for people to start talking about these things. And now, you know, I can see my voice echoed in, of all places, the Huffington Post. And I think that says a lot about the directions we're headed in in this country. And it's not by any means a very good direction. That's my take for what I think will be the last video of uh, 2020, It'll probably get posted on the 31st, which is also my birthday, my 69th birthday. So feel free to wish me a happy birthday in the comments. If you liked the video or didn't like it, leave a comment as well. Give it a thumbs up, a thumbs down, Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Subscribe to the channel. Share the video with your friends. And until the next time, Happy New Year. I God, I hope 2021 is better than 2020. It's hard to consider it could be worse. But hey, I'm a guy who's warning about civil war. Who can say? But in any event, keep fighting.